And uh, yeah, 20 minutes it was? Yes, well, yeah, well let's keep it to uh, eight, I think. Uh, <laughs> well, really well, that's quite, quite eight, short. Eight minutes. Five, five minutes or five minutes. minutes run over. Yeah. Oh, right. Five minute talk. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Luca, show not that. Good luck. Yes. All right. Well, let's. Ah, oh, my computer is crapping up. Okay, let's try and get it uh, better this way then. Two seconds. No. Very soon. All right, and all of a sudden it works. Let's pray it, it keeps working. So hello everybody, and uh, time for the um, last and probably the least uh, talk of today. But um, bear with me. Uh, there is beer at the end, hopefully. So you know that's always something that keeps me uh, hoping and, and my hopes up. So um, my name is Ilkka Turunen. Um, you, you have probably never even heard of me, but um, in fact, I launched the OpenStack Finland user group in 2011 uh, when OpenStack was in its second release. So uh, I'm a solutions architect working for a company called Sonotype. A little bit, lay, a little bit more about what that company does a little bit later. But um, in, my, in my profession and in my role and my kind of professional background, I've been working with companies in uh, large and small here uh, in Finland and in, um, in um, Europe in general, um, defining their continuous delivery pipelines. And I've seen, I've seen how thing, things happen in a small startup. I used to have my own small startup and I've seen how it happens in a Fortune uh, 100, I think top 10 company uh, as well. So there's a huge difference between a DevOps uh, environment uh, uh, in, a, in a very small environment because you know you are the devs and the ops and and you know where you know you can just throw money at the problem and hope it goes away so what I wanted to talk to you guys uh, about today is 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 perhaps um, a little bit higher thoughts than just DevOps so I'm uh, the DJ guys here gave quite a good uh, concise description of what DevOps means, you know, compared to the old traditional ways of working. And um, what I want to talk today about is how, how should we take things like security and things like legal governance and all that boring stuff that really just makes everybody's life difficult, uh, a little bit better into the, um, into the um, uh, whole mix. So, um, uh, Sonotype, the company that I work for, uh, is an interesting one. It's, it's one of those companies that you've never even heard of. But who hears, here knows Java at all? You know, Java the language. Most people. All right. Well, Sonotype was founded by a couple of guys from uh, America that uh, developed a tool called Maven. You may have heard of it. So Maven is the most uh, used build tool uh, across the world in, in Java. Basically, basically um, used to um, compile binaries uh, based from your Java source code, link dependencies, and do all sorts of cool things as you kind of move along in your software de development process. And uh, it started off with two guys in a garage, or actually one of them was in Canada and one of them was in Boston, and they kind of just exchanged emails but nowadays nowadays Maven is everywhere there's about nine million instances of Maven worldwide um, and pretty soon the, for these guys uh, uh, it became apparent that in order to build software and in order to kind of take away the pain of building software one cool thing that needed to be done was to create a repository where you can put uh, and share binaries um, that you've created because we as software professionals are always thought if you find it on the internet if someone else else has figured it out steal that don't create anything yourself and absolutely don't do cryptography because that just won't you know just don't touch it so nowadays with NSA mm, not not so sure um, so they created um, uh, Maven Central as the back end and to this day uh, we as Sonotype we run the Maven Central repository and it, it got about 21 billion downloads last year and we have about 1.1 uh, million unique Java artifacts uh, in there. So as a company, we have quite a good visibility on what happens in the world of open source and what happens in the world of software engineering as, as Java you know, is pretty much you know, the defining language for enterprise applications. Um, 
Well, after after we kind of started uh, with uh, a hosted version of our own hosted version uh, of hosting binaries, and we kind of realized very fast that um, you need something to uh, keep your binaries inside your own organization as well. And that's how um, something called the Nexus repository, again, you may have heard of it or maybe not, uh, became into existence. And today, to, today, the Nexus repository is the world's most used binary artifact repository. You can think about it as, as a version control system for binaries. And finally, um, what, we, what our products are uh, is, a, is a tool called Nexus Lifecycle then, then, that then allows you to automate controls over what binaries you use, for example, from Nexus or from Maven Central, and nowadays also in other languages like, uh, uh, like um, uh, you know, NuGet or uh, .NET or whatever. Um, here's an assortment of companies uh, that um, uh, we work with, so some logos you may, may recognize, um, and another page as well. Uh, there's Nokia over there, so you know, a little Finnish pride uh, in there as well. So, I mean, the truth is, um, uh, truth is, um, this is the corporate section. This is now I've justified my trip to come here. Um, but um, truth is really, uh, you know, irrevocably, software has permeated every single part of our lives. So, as Mark Anderson said in 2011, software is eating the world. And as we've learned today, you know, from toys, from uh, smart watches, Google watches for the win, by the way, uh, uh, you know, presentation gear, laptops, everything has software. Your router has software, your car has software, and so on. And uh, software is eating the world. More people need to basically, there are these arguments that software should be the basic skill, you know, JavaScript, the basic assembly, software is the basic skill of future workforces. But the skeptic might also say, software is infecting the world because uh, what we could see is is that um, as software moves uh, forward and gets put into new and more interesting places it also exposes us to new and interesting attack vectors because where there is software to a security professional there might be vulnerabilities but the march of software has been largely due to a phenomena within software Luckily, it's uh, spearheaded by one of our Finnish uh, colleagues, um, open source software. So open source software uh, has helped us transform software development from sitting down and inventing the wheel again for yourself to people uh, figuring something out and sharing it with the community under, uh, under a, certain type of, um, uh, a certain type of license or other things. So that's just an email from the uh, kernel uh, maintainers list. Uh, Linus is being very polite in this one, so um, yeah. But um, what software, what open source software has really done for the industry cannot be understated. Open source software has enabled us to focus on actually delivering value instead of focusing on the mundane everyday tasks. You know, you need a HTTP client, download a HTTP client. You need um, you need uh, the Java frameworks, get a, get a Java framework, you know, from Google. Get a t need a testing framework. J unit, whatever. And in fact, so the software development and design today as a profession is less like building a single house. It's more like urban design. In fact, a lot of the time when we design software and what we do, a lot of time is actually spent thinking about what part should we use within in our applications and what pieces of functionality should we put in there. And it's almost like assembling Legos, you know, uh, I need that HTTP library, I'll use a HTTP library, or I need a, you know, SSL library, open SSL. Yeah. The world is our oyster, and in fact, most of the mundane tasks, you can just uh, come in. And in fact, um, the question then becomes, if open source is quite prevalent, and um, open source is out there, how much of our applications is open source, and how much is, how much is our own code? You know, if we take an application from my cell phone, from wherever, how much of it is actually your own code? Well, seeing as we run the Maven uh, Central Repository and, and we have access to those companies that you saw, we did a little bit of a survey and we found out that the average enterprise application will be 90% open source code and only 10% custom code. Well, the developers in the room will probably be, well, doesn't surprise me. Non-developers, maybe, maybe not. But the number to me seems quite high. To me, I think that's not possible. 
But the truth is, um, software acts, uh, comes in chain. And open source, for example, comes in chains that you may not think about. So for example, here is a visualization of all of the artifacts in Maven Central uh, a, about a half year ago, I think. And so we ran a little bit of a visualization of the contents of it. And this cloud, this kind of organic looking dust mite, is actually a visualization of every single com component and their interdependencies to other components within the Maven Central repository. And as you can see, all of these dots connect to other dots that connect to other dots. There are some islands kind of over there on the edges. But as we can see, dependencies and your dependencies will usually have what is known as transient dependencies. You know, the developers of that really cool piece of functionality have depended on other really cool pieces of functionality that depends on other really cool pieces of functionality. And so the recursion goes. Right. So that, of course, brings us to the topic of well, what about the security thing then? Like I kind of alluded earlier on, so if software is infecting the world, what happens? And well, a lot of unplanned work happens for a lot of people. So some of you guys may recognize this logo. Uh, I think it was uh, disclosed by Codenomicon, yet another Finnish flag to wave in the world. Um, and um, and um, so Heartbleed uh, was uh, the big thing last year. You know, Heartbleed was infecting everything and everybody was scrambling to fix Heartbleed out of their systems. But the truth is, for a lot of the noise that Heartbleed caused, in the National Vulnerability Database, in the same year, we had 30 other vulnerabilities e with equal severity or higher uh, than Heartbleed. So uh, vulnerabilities, when they're disclosed in the National Vulnerability Database, the CVE codes you see online, um, they get a score. That score runs from 1 to 10. Uh, 10 being really, really bad and exploitable vulnerability. 1 being meh, you know, let's be aware of it. Uh, heart please is a solid 5. And for all the grief and all the work it caused, there were other, function, other uh, vulnerabilities that went completely unnoticed at that very same year. Who, you know, if you, if you just uh, pay attention to the ones that have a nice name and the ones that have, uh, you know, a cool website with a nice little catchy logo, you actually kind of miss the point that these things come out all the time. For example, just uh, about three weeks ago, a big deserialization vulnerability was disclosed in the Commons Collections uh, uh, sets of artifacts that is a very, very common piece of Java code to use. So Commons Collections deals with deserialization of data, a very basic piece of, uh, piece of functionality. And in fact, um, using that uh, vulnerability, you could compromise JBoss, WebSphere, or pretty much anything, anything that runs in Java. And it, this gets really scary when we start thinking about the internet of broken things, uh, in the sense that um, as we're putting software into more and more places, the question really becomes, we need to do something about, uh, about the hygiene. Because when you, when you put Bluetooth functionality into an insulin pump, as, an, as a certain American manufacturer actually did, what can happen then is some really, really uh, cool researcher goes in and uh, you know, plugs their own phone on that Bluetooth interface and manages to empty the entire syringe uh, at once. And you know, that doesn't do very healthy things for you. So when lives are starting to be at stake, this really becomes a problem. And for example, last year we had a vulnerability from Fiat Chrysler that allowed you to compromise the entire car's controls over the infotainment system. So if you think about it, plugging your you know, phone through the Bluetooth into the radio so you can listen to Spotify, you could also actually access the CAN bus and the entire car. That's really scary. And the truth is, um, a lot of these, if 90% of uh, our code is actually not our own code, most companies don't really spend that much time in having any hygiene in what they are putting into their applications. And especially when these things, you know, move, move into these spheres, this is when this scenario becomes a little bit scary. And for all it's worth, I think what my CTO at Sonotype, a guy called Josh Corman, says uh, is that we lack building codes for building code. We don't really have good guidelines into managing this thing because it's actually really, really hard. 
Um, finding information about your dependencies takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy and effort for you to go to, for example, Google or other places. Uh, other places. And another thing that we see is that, for example, as developers, um, we are motivated and compensated um, and incentivized to deliver more and deliver faster. So um, for, uh, for developers, what we want to do is we want to deliver new functionalities and new code and faster than our competitors because, you know, time is money and faster we deliver new features on time and on budget and uh, with acceptable quality and risk. Um, that's exactly what you want to do. So, you know, you don't want to spend time, you know, slowing down and necessarily going into Google. And uh, the DevOps movement or, you know, whatever ops movement you want to call it, uh, there are many other things in the world as well that I'll be briefly talking to you about, has done a tremendous job at optimizing exactly that. More on time, more uh, on budget and hopefully, you know, with acceptable quality as well by bringing the operations. And I really like that uh, Docker demo because it really shows how, you know, software defined infrastructure is the future. You know, software defined infrastructure becomes like software. But if we talk about security, this is at least to me how the security guy has always looked like. It's that little troll under the bridge that sits right before the finish line. So as you're just about to deliver your application, you've spent months doing it, many sprints, iterations, you know, people talking to you, you're great, everything's fine. And then, you know, Chewbacca over here crawls out and they're like, let's do a new security audit now. And, uh, you know, that takes a couple of weeks, you, an external company comes in, and finally you get slapped with a massive report in your face that de details every single thing you did wrong. And then someone has to go down and, you know, figure out what the problem actually is. You know, um, you know, a project manager usually goes and prioritizes, you know, these are risks that we need to mitigate, these are still acceptable risk. So what I argue is that we should instead be talking about anything ops. We should be thinking about not only just bringing developers closer to operators, we should be thinking about bringing everybody together into the same value delivery loop. Luckily, from a security perspective, there are already a couple of movements. Maybe you've heard of these, maybe you haven't. For example, there's a program run by an American developer called Shannon Leach, uh, which is called DevSecOps, devsecops.org. Um, which, which kind of advocates a, instead of an agile manifesto, agile advocates a security manifesto. I'm not going to read them out. Uh, we can look at them later on uh, with the beers. And there's also something called the Rugged, Ma Rugged uh, Software Foundation or the Rugged Manifesto, uh, which, which, uh, which is called Rugged DevOps. Uh, that also has another set of kind of more secure tenants. From this, what I like is it says, I recognize that my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economical, and national security. So the truth is, it says, accept that your code will break, and it will probably be broken by someone that's smarter than you. So prepare for it, if you can. But either way, all of these movements advocate shifting left. So shifting left is a concept where, you know, if you can do actions earlier on, for example, fix or mitigate a bug or a vulnerability very early in the development process, it's cheaper and it's faster. Whereas in, if you do it in a, what I like to call the scan and scold methodology, where the troll comes from under the bridge and slaps your report on you, um, that costs a lot of money. So if you can find ways to actually bring those sorts of functions earlier on in the process, for example, right on day one, you know, you've sa saved a lot of money and from a developer point of view, a lot of nerves as well, because it makes life a lot easier. Well, how do we do it then? How, how can we kind of mitigate these risks? And often it's not just enough to, you know, do your best, but you kind of want to also uh, know what to do and then do your best at it. So if we look at information security th uh, uh, theory, um, what it suggests is the most safe, uh, most safe um, uh, 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 investments you can make is into building defensible software. For example, if you have the choice of, uh, you know, doing something quickly and building a shed or doing something a bit, taking a little bit longer, but then building a stony castle and then the zombie apocalypse happens, you want to be in the castle instead of the uh, shed because, you know, the hordes of zombies, if anyone's dying light, you know, you'll know uh, 
that's not going to be a good place to be in. So you should really look into creating the right sort of infrastructure from the get-go. And to kind of bring it into development and to bring it into, into kind of the mix, uh, the where, I, where I see this should happen is in the onion model of testing. So I call this my onion model of testing because, you know, testing occurs at every level of deployment. You know, it starts from writing unit tests for your objects, starts by, continues by having integration tests, functional tests, acceptance tests, and so on. So testing is kind of like a layered approach where, you know, each layer of testing supports one another. Well, now that we've, we're aware that, you know, we have this external set of code that we need to have in our applications, then I think we should uh, include things like governance testing and all of these different layers. So like we test our own code, we should have quality tests for the amounts of components and the amounts of little individual pieces of uh, binaries that we put into our applications to make sure that whatever we do, it's of sufficient quality and it's uh, good. And instead of that happening as a kind of afterthought, it actually becomes a part of the development. It becomes yet another suite of tests to pass. Like, you know, if your Jenkins build doesn't clear, you know, you don't move on until they, your tests pass. It's the same thing. Well, what do I test then for this type of thing? Well, for this, we need to look into traditional industries. So in the manufacturing industries, they've long been uh, familiar with a concept called uh, the bill of materials. Well, a bill of materials is just a list of all of the externally supplied components that you put in your, for example, car. Car manufacturers will have these lists, this bill of materials, for every screw and every nut and every bolt that goes into your car, all the way up to the software systems. So we should, as a, as a profession, also learn to create these sorts of bills of materials. And I'll tell you the reason why. The reason is, um, last year, according to a report published by Verizon, the Verizon Data Breach Report, um, about 97% of uh, documented attacks and analyzed attacks uh, in the US last year were only done using 10 known vulnerabilities. So 97% of, of uh, attacks that reached the cost in a compromise leveraged only 10 completely known CVEs. And if we look at the year number, so CVEs have a year code here, the oldest one of them was disclosed in 2001. So perhaps the first thing you can do is not have those in your software. You know, do a bill of materials and then cross-check and not have those things. You know, find out what is it that you do well and then don't do, the, then do only those things. Well, in my day-to-day -day job, uh, I see an anti-pattern also occurring. Because once you start thinking about it, okay, we need to have, you know, a list of bills of materials. Um, and we need to not have those CVEs. What oftentimes managers think, oh my God, risk, got to control it. And what they do is they put a guy in a gray suit in a corner room called the chief information security officer. And um, those guys then create a list of approved components and uh, anything that isn't on the list, you don't use. Well, the problem with this is, is it's immensely hard to maintain those types of lists. It's so hard, in fact, that if we look at an average application. An average application will have 120 external components in it. Well, if we look at a company like, um, you know, a mid-sized company with a couple of hundred developers, well, no, it's quite huge in Finland, so let's say, you know, a couple of hundred developers, you'll find the easily about 500 different libraries spread across your uh, language estate. And those libraries usually come in more than one version as well. So if you do 500, let's say, two versions of each times two, and uh, let's make a conservative estimate, it takes you about 15 minutes to Google all information. That's a lot of time, and that's a human uh, work year all, all the way over there. And in fact, it could even be a team of people. So it costs a lot of money to do those types of things. Instead, what we should be doing is we should be automating these types of, types of tests. So instead of the security guys being the code or the, or the uh, guidance authorities, these guys should become, like operators and QA people have become in development, toolsmiths. They should bring their security tools into the development pipeline itself so that we can test for these in an automatic fashion as development occurs. Because that is the only way that we can maintain a concurrent list. Well, of course, uh, 
you know, uh, you could do things like uh, create uh, risk reports uh, about your components. Um, of course, my company does sell tools, but there are other, as an asterisk, there are other vendors as well. So, for example, what you can then do is create uh, continuous uh, intelligence of what you're using in, in your uh, bill of materials today. Um, but what is important is to have this bill of materials and enforce it throughout the software development life cycle. So from the very first build, you should be doing this test um, and checking whether or not, for example, uh, some component has a known vulnerability or maybe it has a bad license that your company doesn't want to use or whatever you know the reason may be. There are many things about components that you should mind and I could probably talk all night but uh, looking at the clock uh, it's running out so I won't. But anyway what we can do is, is then for example you know enforce policies as a part of a build. So like I said a test. A test that should be minded just like any other test and just like every any other test it should be um, uh, it should be um, uh, integratable into something like a continuous delivery pipeline so you should use this as a part of your delivery processes already to make sure that whatever you're putting out there doesn't contain those bad things doesn't contain those 10 CVEs and make that a quality gate because you know that way you've mitigated a massive amount of risk from the get-go and then finally of course you know, vulnerabilities wait for no man and security isn't something that you should do as an auditory function from the pure uh, standpoint that, for example, Shellshock was in bash for about 20 years before it was discovered, officially discovered, I mean. That means, you know, there might have been someone in some country in some laboratory figuring it out a lot earlier and just never disclosing it to the world. So when these things occur, it's important that we have information enabled uh, uh, for everybody who's involved in that software development ecosystem in a language that they can understand so you can start having conversations about we should probably fix this before it gets too bad for us. So in summary in, in condensed lovely milk form uh, I believe see, we should be talking about something like DevSecOps or rugged DevOps or any ops. I think we should be talking about bringing all of these support functions, be they legal support functions or security functions or other types of post audit uh, type of things as a part of the value creation process. Because if you can mitigate a problem early on, you can perhaps stop a chain reaction from happening from, uh, from moment one. If you just had adjusted this upright, maybe this whole thing might have not happened. Well, that's my talk, really. Uh, I hope you learned something out of it. Thanks. Questions? Everyone is quiet. Shocked. Everyone's okay. everyone's too tired. I think I think there's the rest of the beer outside, isn't it? Yeah, there's still some beer left, so uh, you can ask Ilka the questions uh, over beer. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Yelmer, for doing uh, most of the organization and uh, organizing yeah. the pizzas. Um, and do we have a next one planned already? February and uh, back in April uh, in this office. Ah, so uh, back in April and uh, see you all then. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.